You can be seated. That was a perfect chapter to read, brother. All right. Like I said, a little bit difficult, harder to preach this type of a message, but uh, I'm focusing on different aspects. Uh, last week, last Sunday, I, I talked a lot about the uh, just a general overview of evangelizing the world, and I've, I've hit on that. I've, in Iola, we talked about the religions of the world. We hit a brief, just a brief overview of the religions of the world, and, and we're going to be hitting on those every week uh, throughout this month, this upcoming month. And so what I want to do on Thursdays is we'll be talking about the influences of these different people groups on the United States. Now, one of the beautiful things I think about the United States is that it's the melt, a melting pot. It's that there are various cultures represented everywhere, which makes it makes it so silly for anybody in the United States to be racist because of the fact that we're just a just conglomeration of cultures here in the United States. So uh, so really, that's, you know, that's my thinking, you know, and it gets real easy to use terminology or whatever that might sound racist. I find myself even sometimes in messages like later thinking, I can't believe I said that. Some people might have thought that sounded really racist, but honestly, I don't feel like I think in terms of, you know, those people and our people or whatever. In the United States, I don't I just don't feel like that's that's a thing. It shouldn't be a thing. You know, we're all just one nation. And so that should be the case anyway. And uh, I think that it would be natural, you know, if we just put aside any false ideas or false feelings about different people groups or whatever, I would think it would be natural for us all to just say, man, how beautiful it would be just to take you know, parts of this culture and parts of that culture and just add to add to our collection, you know, if you will. You really think about that. It just adds color. It adds spice. It adds, a, you know, a different flavor to your just regular, you know, uh, boring life, I guess, or whatever. You know, if it was just one culture, one way, it might just kind of get old, you know, but then you add different things in there. I think it's normal that that would be a desire. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the different strangers, if you will, and how the Hebrew people were uh, in the Old Testament. They had, they always had the strangers living among them. They opened their doors, and if they were in Egypt, you know, when they left Egypt, some of those Egyptians went with them, you know. And in in Babylon, it was the same way. Some of the Babylonians went with them, and they just they they didn't, you know, they opened their their doors. Now I realize, uh, particularly now, when you talk to somebody, and I guess even in Jesus' time. When you talk to somebody who was a Jew, it was just like, hey, we are God's chosen people and everybody else, you know, is going to lick our feet someday or something like that. <laughs> and uh, seriously, they got some weird teachings like that. But, um, but you know, really historically, I believe it was just like an understanding that, hey, different cultures are, are out there and they're God, you know, God created them too. And, and, uh, and, and on the surface level, I believe that it's right, and it's it's a beautiful thing in the United States, particularly, is what we're thinking about that we just accept different cultures and different, um, you know, and really, it's all been woven into the fabric of our country anyway, our culture anyway. Now we might say, no, this is American culture. This is what we do in America, but really, America's culture is made up of a whole bunch of different different cultures. Okay, so if you think about this in the Bible, now I don't know about you, I grew up. Uh, you know, in some places, I remember hearing, now a lot, I'm not that old, but I remember hearing, you know, some different views on interracial marriage and how, oh, no, that's that's against God, and, you know, you should never mix races, and if you're white, you need to marry a white person. If you're black, you marry a black person. Now, let me say this. I believe there could be wisdom in telling your child, hey, don't just go out to the other cultures of the world, and, you know, you don't know anything about their upbringing or, or you know, how their family's going to accept you. I don't think that's wrong for parents to say that to the kids. I think the kids should honor their parents enough to like listen to that kind of advice or whatever. But when you really break down, like, is it wrong? Where in the Bible does it say, you know, you a white person can't marry a black person, a African person can't marry a, you know, where you say that? I, I would say nowhere. You can't find that in the Bible unless you're a Ruckmanite and you've got a way of twisting the scripture to, uh, to say that. I don't really know what Ruckman taught on that. I just, I've heard him... Uh, <clears throat> I've heard that he taught that, that you had to stay within your races. 
Now, let me give you a couple of Bible examples, and this isn't about interracial marriage or anything like that, but let me give you a couple of Bible verses. Look at Genesis 41, verse 45. Of course, Joseph was sold into Egypt and eventually works his way up to where he's uh, you know, basically uh, in a high position of leadership, and and he's rewarded by that. He's been a blessing to that country. And so Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephanath Paneah, and he gave him his wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out uh, over all the land of Egypt. Okay, so apparently Joseph goes into that country, he's in Egypt, and he's given an Egyptian wife. don't see anything in the Bible where it says that that was wrong. I have seen people try to try to twist that and say, oh, no, 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 she was an Egyptian. See, she actually was taken a slave from the Jews, and then uh, and then whenever, since, since Joseph was there, you know, he said, oh, you're a Jew, and so she's a Jew, and so you can marry. People will twist the Bible to make it fit their, <laughs> their views, okay? But I don't see that as being the case. Look at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Uh, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and uh, unto Aaron. And unto Miriam, come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation, and they, came, and they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Him will I speak mouth to mouth, even... Uh, apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Nowhere does he come back and say, Moses, all right, now I scolded Miriam and Aaron, but let me ask you, why are you married to an Ethiopian? <laughs> he doesn't say that. And Moses was, uh, you know, he married the Ethiopian, and it didn't seem to be a major deal. Now, I won't I won't go there, but 1 Kings talks about Solomon. We know Solomon had tons of wives from different cultures. And again, naturally, I'm not saying that was right, but naturally there's that desire. There's that curiosity. Hey, let's just, you know, see what these other cultures are like. And let me, some of the relationships, the marrying relationships were probably more than just, hey, he's attracted to foreign women. Uh, probably some of it was, hey, we are, you know, there would be now a connection between our nation and your nation, and, and maybe there were some political reasons for that. But whatever the case, he added all these different uh, people to his, uh, uh, even women to his, um, I started to say collection. That doesn't sound right, but I guess that's kind of what it was. <laughs> and, uh, and when you read so Song of Solomon, you know, the lady there that's writing uh, as, as Solomon's lover, she's like, my skin is black. She goes on about how her, her skin is black. And, and, uh, and anyway, uh, so I think that, you know, from, a, from just a basic standpoint of just looking at human nature, you know, hey, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're just made of fle flesh and bones. You know, we all have the DNA of Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, I don't believe, I believe Adam and Eve, Eve had the, the DNA of all the colors, all the races of the world now, it was all in their DNA. Over time, you know, there's different variances, just like you see all throughout all God's creation, you know, different plants and different animals and species that are alive today. You look at them, and, and that's not what they probably looked like a long time ago, but those original creatures that God created have uh, potential inside them in their DNA to be able to come these other things as well. Okay, I'm, I don't believe in evolution in the sense of, you know, the, uh, the fish never became a bird. The scales didn't turn into feathers or anything like that. But 
all those variants within the species. And so I think in the, in the human race, you know, some humans looked a certain way. You know, we look at their, uh, the fossils now and they say, oh, this was a different race of people. No, they just, they, they just had a different shape, you know what I mean, in their, in their skull or whatever. And uh, some people, you know, began in these different regions because of the, the climate or whatever. They, they, they had some slight variations, right? I don't believe uh, there's one view out there that says when Noah was in the ark, you know, he, he had three sons and uh, uh, one was black, one was Asian, and one, <laughs> have you ever heard that? Like these three, like totally different colors, and they all went after the flood, and they went and started there. And this is the, some of the beliefs that, that are out there, you know, and why people say, hey, you have to stay with your own race or whatever. Uh, some people say Ham, because of the sin that he committed after the, the flood, he was cursed and his skin was black. Look, he may have been the father of, you know, uh, the genealogy of people in Africa or whatever that ended up darker skin or whatever, but God didn't curse them with black skin. You know, I don't see any evidence for that. And so, uh, but there's weird views out there. Okay. But bottom line is whatever the reason for the mixture of the DNA and the different races in the world or whatever, what we just got done reading in Romans 10, let's go back there real quick. And I love this chapter. I honestly didn't even think about it when I, I was just kind of shooting from the hip. I was like, hey, we need something to read. I forgot to tell Brother Justin. But this was probably the best one of all the scriptures I have to give you tonight. Uh, this would have been the perfect chapter, and it was. Paul's heart in this chapter shows, of course, he loved the Hebrews. He loved his people. Right? He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and, and he wanted them to get saved. And so he said his heart, his desire for Israel is that they might be saved you know, we might say today, my desire for the United States is that they might be saved. My desire for Africa is that they might be saved. You know, my desire for Israel is that they might be saved. I mean, uh, it does. It's not like this whole chapter is just saying, look, you know, all God really cares about is Israel. You know, he doesn't care about the rest of the world. He just cares about Israel. The Bible's not saying that at all. And so uh, Paul is just speaking his heart at that time. That's why he kept going in the synagogues and he went preaching to, uh, to the Jews because that's what his burden was for. He wanted to see them saved. But when you get to verse 12, am I, is it 12? Yeah, verse 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So no matter what, the physical differences are on the outside. When people come to put their faith in Jesus Christ, God sees their soul, and guess what? The soul is the same, whether it's Jew, Gentile, you know, Greek, uh, whether it's uh, even male or female. Now, don't twist those words, okay? But no difference, and it comes to the spiritual value and the spiritual worth uh, that God sees, okay? Here's the problem that comes from mixing uh, marriages. Now, I'm not talking about because of race or anything like that. Here's the one thing that we see in the Bible that is still true today. You don't want to mix with a person who is going to turn you from following the Lord, turn you to a false God, turn you to a false way of thinking. You know, your desire has to be towards the Lord. And if God leads you to a saved person who's of a, of a different race or ethnicity, whatever, that's his prerogative. Right? But you're, you're both saved. You share that common uh, uh, denominator. All right, so uh, look at Malachi chapter 2. This really has nothing to do so far with the influence of Africa on the United States, but we'll get there. All right, Malachi chapter 2, and look at verse 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacle of Joseph, and, uh, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And he goes on here. But the thing was, he's saying, like, hey, they... They committed this great sin, and they went to the daughters of these other gods. You see, that's a big difference. That's a spiritual uh, intermingling 
with something that's not holy, something that's profane, something that's not uh, godly. And that's still true for us today. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. We should never, our hearts should never be intertwined with those who are unbelievers. You know, whether it's your family, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody that you're interested in marrying, whether it's somebody, you know, uh, even that you just hang out with all the time, your best friend. Should be something in you that says, hey, if that person will not come to the Lord, doesn't care about the things of the Lord, you know, not saved, or even if they are saved, but they just want to live for the world or whatever, we shouldn't have that attachment with them because our heart is with the Lord. And we, we, we want better things, you know, that the Lord wants for us to have. And I believe that's very clear throughout the Bible that as Christians, that should be our desire. It doesn't mean be ugly or rude to, to people that aren't saved. Uh, obviously, we want to reach them. We want to be a good example to them. But our heart and our desire should be to be equally yoked with believers. <clears throat> okay, look at 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians six, verse 14. Here's the verse that I'm talking about. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what uh, concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he uh, that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temples of the living God, are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, uh, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he's saying that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, okay? It doesn't even make sense. Now, we live in a world today, like I said, all these cultures are intermingled, and, uh, and we love that. Hey, we, we, we're diverse in that way, and we're, you know, we're open to learning new cultures. I mean, most of us are, and, uh, and, and understanding different ways of life or whatever. But here's the big problem in the United States. Look, the United States is like also like the capital of the world when it comes to some pretty wicked stuff. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, part of that is because everybody's just intermingled with all these different views and they've left God out of the picture, right? That's the whole the purpose of the whole public school, you know, leaving God out and, uh, and all that. Why? Because we want to be diverse. We want to accept everybody. Well, we can accept them as our neighbor. We can love them. We can care for them. We can preach the gospel to them. Praise the Lord that we have uh, all people from all over the world coming to the United States. That's great. We just don't want to get to the point where we're just, hey, or ecumenical, you know, whatever, you know, your God is, is the right God. My God's the right God. We just serve him a little bit differently. That's absolutely false. And, I'm, and I hate that so many Christians actually talk like that. And sometimes Christians go to other countries and they go and they're like, oh, you know, I'll just call my God Allah, right? It's the same God. Not the same God, man. We got to use a different terminology because uh, we're talking about different worldviews. And we can't just be like, hey, that's great. You know, uh, I love that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I love the way you go up to an Amish person. I love the way Amish people dress or something like that. Hey, we got to be careful at some point. Now, I mean, that, that was a bad example. But <laughs> we got to be careful at some point where we're just like totally interested in their culture and their religion to the point where it's hey, that's great. I'm so happy for you. God bless you. You know, we've got to understand that our job is to give them the gospel and bring them to the Lord you know, so that they would share in that same faith that we do and be part of that same family. Un until that point, they're our neighbors, we love them, we're kind to them, but we're not yoked up with them. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, that should be our understanding when it comes to intermingling with uh, people in the world. Now, in a, in a rather unique way, Africa has been woven into the fabric of the United States, okay? Ironically, I, I, uh, maybe not ironically, but very interestingly, much of that has to do with slavery, okay? And the civil rights movement and all that stuff uh, that came, you know, over many years of time, okay? Now, early on, with a lot of the slaves that were in the United States, 
there were some interest into the culture, but the way I understand it, okay, and I'm not an expert by any means, and I don't have time to become an expert on all these cultures this month, but uh, just allow me to give an overview into the best that I know how to explain when slaves, and I'm talking about, now look, there were some slaves that, in my opinion, wasn't a bad deal, okay? They were just working for something. There was different cultures, okay? It wasn't all African-Americans, or it wasn't all Africans. But there were, we understand, there were illegal actions. There were people that you know, went over to West Africa, made some kind of trade or whatever, and basically human trafficking where they stuffed uh, tons and tons of people that had like, you know, they were like on top of each other, basically in the bottom of the ship, laying on each other, and they smuggled them to the United States so that they can sell, or in Europe and all these other places, Caribbean, where they could sell them as to, as slaves. Now the Bible says that those men would be man stealers, and actually the punishment for that was death. Okay, so there's nothing about that that was right. In fact, many years later, uh, I uh, around the Civil War time. They tried to do right, make right for that, and said, you know what we'll do, we'll give you, and I, this is the first time I ever actually studied this in detail, but I've been studying about Liberia. And Liberia is basically like the only part of Africa that's basically the United States, right? But it's, but it's basically like those people who had come, had been made slaves in the United States, and they had been raised here and lived here and got familiar with the, the American culture to some degree, now they were shipped back off because they were no longer slaves. And, hey, we stole you from the land. So, hey, we'll go and we'll put you in this land and you can settle it and you can come up with your own laws or whatever. And guess what? They mirrored the laws of the United States because they were like, hey, we, we might as well do it like the United States did. And so now Liberia is like this little micro United States that's basically, it's African people, but they speak English. And they uh, it's an inter interesting thing. You should study that out if you never uh, have seen that before. But, uh, uh where was I going with that? Okay, so, uh, but anyway, so that through that whole process of, of because many, many of the slave, many of the people didn't go back to Africa. So why would we want to go there? You know, we're, we're not Africans anymore. We're, this is, this is who we are. So they stayed and then they began fighting, you know, civil rights and all that kind of stuff for many, many, many years. And slowly that ended up being woven into the fabric of our culture. And actually, of course, you know, they got Black History Month and all that. I've never really been big on all that kind of stuff. Kwanzaa around Christmas time. What in the world? I don't, you know, I've just never been big on that stuff. But I do love, for instance, going to Kansas City, uh, uh, what's the name of the Nelson's Atkins Museum. And there's some uh, of the artwork that really represents the culture, you know, in Kansas City and and other places uh, uh, where there was a lot of the the intermingling, I guess, you know, where the, you know, jazz, for instance, you know, a lot of blacks introduced jazz during that time, and they brought it somewhat from their culture, right? I'll talk about that here in a second. And so a lot of these things have been introduced. So if you were trying to study what is the African influence on the United States, most of what you're going to find is the African-American influence on the United States, which has to do with a long history of, of Africans in America, but not necessarily Africans in the continent of Africa. Okay, and so here are some different areas that Africa has influenced uh, America. And, and let me say this. Okay, so I want to be careful how I say it make sure I'm... All right, because sometimes what I say comes out wrong. <laughs> okay. I, th I almost think that it's wrong to call blacks in America right today, today's day and age, to call them African-American, right? Now, most black people will tell you, I'm not African. I don't know anything about African culture. I don't, you know. In fact, there's actually, a, 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 for many years, there's been a lot of tension between Afri people from Africa, they were born in Africa, and now they live in the United States, and people who have never been to Africa, they just raised in the United States, just black Americans, right? Uh, there's been a lot of tension. They don't necessarily get along. They have different reasons for not, you know, appreciating the other, other person. Now, some of them do, but, but that's, that's enlarged the way that it is. And I've always thought it was weird. I remember the first time that I heard people saying African-American, I was like, African-American? I mean, like, they're not, they're not from Africa. What about, what about South Africa? Those guys are, most of those guys are white, you know? And so you got one of the, a guy from South Africa comes to the United States and he's white. 
they won't call him African American, <laughs> but he would be African American. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I always thought it was really weird that they call African American, right? Now, when they were brought from Africa and they're brought to the United States and they're living in a somewhat of a foreign country, even a second, third generation, yeah, they're African Americans, right? But we're talking about many years have gone by. You know, this is why it's so weird to me that there would still be uh, any uh, tension between, between whites and blacks about what happened hundreds of years ago, right? Because it's not us. We don't know anything. Now, if you want to be mad because, hey, this guy, you know, called you, a, used a racial slur or something like that, or they were fighting, well, that's just human nature. You know, we see someone that's different than us and we just say things about them and they say things about us and you smell funny, you look funny, you do this and, that, and that's just that's just nature, you know. Uh, and uh, and I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's just that's just how we are. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so this many years later, like we should be over it. Right. Blacks, whites, we should be able to work together. We should be able to live together. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be a deal. Uh, but. It started with African Americans that were literally like born in Africa and then they were raised in the United States. That's where all, a lot of this culture came from. And I would say that if you were black American, maybe you would have an appreciation for that. But you know what? I'm white American and I know nothing about English culture. I know nothing about, you know, I don't even drink tea and eat scones. <laughs> right? I, don't, I, I think I have Irish in me. I don't know anything about Ireland. You know, I'm not even that good of a fighter. I've fought a little bit in my lifetime and I'm not that good. <laughs> I'm not a fighting Irish. I, you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't know anything about their culture. So why would I expect a black American to know anything about African culture? Right. But some people feel like it's so necessary for them to do that. Look, we're Americans. <laughs> we're in the United States. We're just one people group. You know, that's the way it should be. <clears throat> but still, there are things that were brought from Africa into the America that we welcome. All right. Art and entertainments is one of the big things, okay? Crafts, uh, poetry, music, folklore. Uh, you know, look on here. Uh, where's that dress? You don't have that dress on, do you? Okay, sure. We actually bought a dress uh, from, that, from the Ethiopian. I'm trying to help him out, man. He's such a nice guy, and he's given us good deals on everything and all. And we brought a dress from, that was made handmade in Ethiopia. And, uh, and man, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I was kind of surprised it wasn't bright colors. Now, in West Africa, there's a lot of bright colors. But Africa actually brought a lot of patterns and designs and animal prints and, and like uh, batik. I don't know if you're familiar with batik. Like batik, what they do is they'll, they'll put wax on a piece of uh, cloth and then uh, they'll put all these different dyes on there. And then they'll wash that. They'll get rid of the wax. Like you can use an iron or something like that. Get rid of the wax. And then everywhere that wax was, it's now white. Now, I don't know if you've seen that. There's a, it's a, it's a beautiful pattern. It's, so that was an art form that was introduced from Africa, right? And there's a lot of different arts and entertainment. Uh, music, for sure, has been influenced. I already talked about uh, uh, jazz music and stuff like that. And I'm going to get back to that just here in a little bit. But uh, but these are the things, these are some things that were introduced. Now, uh, for many Africans in America during the time of slavery, they relied on the, the, their skills and their crafts that they had from Africa to make them money. So they would come to the United States and they would uh, do all these different things. They could play music. They could uh, make different things with their hands. And, and people would use that and they would actually make more money because they could do that. And some of them actually ended up purchasing their freedom because they made enough money from their skills and their crafts that they had. <laughs> and, uh, and you really saw this. Now, some time passed before this became a deal just because of the nature of, of it. But, uh, but sports, right? By the time uh, blacks were allowed to play sports, man, they just started excelling. And it was just like, wow, look at this guy. He's just really skilled athlete. And he has a running, you know, athletes to this day. Who dominates the world of the mar marathon? Kenyans. And that's not like a racist joke. Kenyans dominate every single time, right? There's very rare people, very few people that can beat the Kenyans in a foot race. And so a uh, long distance foot race. So, uh, so look. Over time, people began to recognize their abilities and said, hey, that's great. And, and to this day, you got white people that say, hey, I want to be like Michael Jordan whenever I grow up, right? Because we've all just embraced 
different cultures, different abilities, different uh, strengths, different weaknesses, and all that. All right. Now, how about the ways of dress? I already mentioned the batik and uh, different prints and stuff like that. Now, here's the thing. Most of us think of Africa and we think naked savages, <laughs> right? Most people think that. And now, look, there are some tribes that are that way. Here's an interesting thing. If you study out now, I don't know how far back, excuse me, but uh, you could look at, okay, there was, one, there was a time. I already talked about Ethiopia and uh, maybe this was in Iola. I can't remember. Ethiopia, Egypt, some places like that, that historically were like epicenters of like the, the very like intellectual people, all the scholars. They wanted to go there, study. There was the schools there and all that kind of stuff, right? And then you fast forward many, many years and it's just like this pagan place, you know, <laughs> and, there, and there, it seems like people are, are like heathen and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, studies have been done on that that are su very surprising. The Mayan Empire, right? There was a time where it was like the, high, the height of, you know, some of the, the math, mathematics and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Many years later, you know, the evolutionists are looking at that like, hey, these guys are savages and all this kind of stuff. It's like, wait a minute. I think we're de devolving instead of evolving, right? And because that's what happens without God. If you don't, if you don't have God, you don't have godly wisdom and all that, your society will begin to, that's why the United States is starting to look like a third world country, right? Because we're slowly devolving away because we're leaving God out and, uh, and we are becoming the naked savages, <laughs> okay? But I talked recently uh, about the religions, the world religions, okay? And 40, let me see here, 30% of the United, uh, I mean, of the whole world calls themselves Christians, okay? Uh, I know they're not all Christians, but that's, that's the, they, they call themselves Christians. And in Africa, it's about 40% that call themselves Christians. And the other, and another 40% call themselves Muslims, and then there's other beliefs, okay? And really, this has been for a long time. When, uh, during the slavery, when they went and they, and they were taking people from Africa and bringing them here, guess what? A lot of them were Muslims in West Africa. They were already Muslims. A lot of them were Christians, believe it or not, already in Africa. And so I really doubt that they were pulling naked people from, you know, that were Muslims and Christians and pulling them naked from Africa and bringing them to the United States. But you know why all the pictures show the slaves being naked? Because when they brought them from their country, they stripped them of all their clothes because they treated them like animals. Can you imagine? You know, it's not like you just walk around naked all the time and all of a sudden they strip you of your clothes and they treat you like you're a cow or something like that and they inspect you and they auction you off like property and you can't even speak the language really so you don't even know how to defend yourself or anything. All you know is if I try to get away, they're going to whip me or whatever. I mean, it, look, it was a rough it was a rough thing. There's not, there's not much good to be said about any of that. But, uh, but they stripped them in many cases, you know, to where they were those naked savages. And then that just kind of became like all the legends and the tales were about those obscure tribes in Africa that were that way. Like I said, now today there are villages. I was talking to the Ethiopian guy in the market and he said, there are some villages or some place out in the bush or whatever where people walk around hardly any clothes and uh, stuff like that. But most of it, it, of Africa is civilized. They're in the cities. They, you know, they have the businesses and all that kind of stuff. But we've got this image in our minds about that. But actually, they brought up very modest clothing in some ways. Like, look at West Africa, man. Those ladies wear the headgear and then the, clo the clothes dress all the way down to the ground and a lot of flowery, bright prints and stuff like that. W Africa brought a lot of that actually to America. The 40s and the 50s, when people started kind of embracing that, in the 1940s, 1950s, they started embracing that. And then you saw our styles and our fashions started incorporating, you know, uh, uh, African uh, styles. But anyway, uh, they added, uh, okay, okay, so here's what I want to say about the, about the dress styles, okay? So somebody might say, what has Africa brought us, you know, today in the United States? How about the hip hop culture? That's what some people will say. 
They'll put that on Africa. <laughs> now, Africa brought jazz. I think rock and roll could be loosely tied back to uh, to Africa in some of the beats and the rhythms and stuff like that. And obviously there's beats and rhythms and rap music. So you could say some of that has ties back to Africa. But the hip hop culture and like the gangster culture is not an African thing. It's not even really, if you think about it, it's not really a black thing. I know that the majority of the hip hop culture is black, but it's actually Latinos, it's white people. I know a lot of white people who are want to be gangsters, right? And listen to rap music and stuff like that and wear their clothes all baggy. You know where the, the sagging of the clothes came from? It came from prison. Now, I don't believe... I don't believe it identified homosexuals like some people say, okay? That's that's the, the myth that's out there. I don't believe that's the case. But here's why it came from prison. Because they give them clothes that were too big and they didn't care that they were too big. And they weren't allowed to have belts because they could hang themselves or they could choke somebody with a belt. So they weren't allowed to have belts. So they went around pulling their pants up all the time, right? And if you think about that, man, I, I knew that. I shouldn't have left that there. And if you think about that, poorer, poorer neighborhoods, okay, uh, tend to have hand-me-down clothes, or they tend to wear whatever they have access to, right? So it's a lot easier just to wear your bro big brother's clothes, you know, because you can't afford to go to the store and get something. So then now you end up with baggy clothes or whatever. Like, look, it just, it's something that just came, you know? It's not, it's not, a, that's not an African thing. But I will tell you this, the hip hop culture is wicked, wicked. It's wicked. Now, look, you can't say like, oh, I'm just so glad we we brought Africa, African music over here. And now we have rap. Aren't you so thankful for the hip hop culture and all that kind of stuff? No, <laughs> I'm not thankful for it. And I'm also not blaming Africa for it. <laughs> OK, this is just human nature, just wicked people who love sex, drugs, you know, violence, all this kind of stuff. There, I, I, I mean, there are. Christian artists who quote unquote who who call themselves rap artists, right? And they use some of the same styles of the hip hop culture. I think that's wicked in and of itself because there's nothing about the rap culture that is good or the hip hop culture that is good. And so, like, why would you want to embrace that and put a Christian label on it? Like, just stay away from it. Be something different, right? Yeah. Why would you want to wear the clothes and look like the gangster and have the big chains with the crosses and all the uh, whatever comes with that, the hats backwards and all that kind of stuff? I don't even know what they do now. The styles have gotten so weird, uh, you know. But why would you want to look like that if you're identifying yourself with something that's very wicked, you know? And I don't understand, like, the... Uh, our society, you know, is all for like women's rights and we need to protect the women. We need to stand up for the women. The hip hop culture is the most vulgar yep. and demeaning to women. Like it's the, I don't know why there's not a huge fight against that. Well, I do know why, because our world is wicked. <laughs> our world stands up and fights for the wrong things. You know, I don't know, I heard a little clip, I haven't really followed it closely, but I heard a uh, clip or read an article saying that in the Olympics, I totally forgot the Olympics were going on. I wanted to watch the opening ceremonies because I like Japan and I wanted to see what they did with it, but I didn't get a chance to watch anything. And uh, for the most part, I don't care about the Olympics because it's just become this huge show, freak show of like, you know, men competing with the women because they think that they're supposed to be women and all this weird stuff, okay? But I saw this interesting article that Norway, how many people know what, I, know what I'm talking about? Uh, Norway, the ladies said, hey, we're tired of the sexualization in sports and in the Olympics. And so we're not going to wear those like bikini bottoms that everybody's wearing. I don't know if it's volleyball team or what, but, you know, I've noticed that the, the uh, gymnast and the volleyball players, you can't watch it. If you're a guy, just don't watch it, right? Because I probably women shouldn't watch it either, but I'm just saying because they're just like practically naked, right? And it's never right to be naked. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so, uh, so they're like practically naked, but these people in, in Norway now, I would still say that they're naked, but they said, we don't, we're not for the sexualization, so we want to wear, so they wore like longer shorts or something like that. They're still spandex probably, uh, the little bit that I saw about it. But they said, we're not going to wear bikinis. They were fined by the Olympics. Like, I don't know why they would find them. Like, is, this, is that supposed to help them to, it's not fair because they have more clothing on or something like that? And so, uh, so that's kind of been a big deal. And it sounds like Norway continued to do that in all these different sports. And they said, hey, we're not, we're not going to do that. Now, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. We need to get involved in that kind of protest, put some clothes on those people. But the Olympic Games and sports and uh, all that fighting and all that boxing, all if you really follow the history, it was all naked back in the very beginning. Uh, the Olympics, you know, kind of comes from Greece, 
Greece was a bunch of wicked, naked uh, perverts. Okay, in the Olympics, the gym, gym, uh, that whole culture was just all about people competing while they were naked and getting these godlike bodies and stuff like that. Look, all that's all that's wicked. But how did I get off on that? Because the point was that our American culture, I mean, human nature is wicked. Okay, so obviously in the United States, we're going to try to bring out the worst things of every possible culture, uh, but that's not what we're talking about. When it comes to spiritual things, honoring God, living holy, serving Him, being Christ-like, you know, uh, there's many things that we're not going to embrace, and I don't care who brings it up. You know, you could be European, you could be, you know, uh, born, raised in, the, in America, you never set foot on another, you know, uh, 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 foreign soil, and you have this great idea. If it goes against the Bible, it's wicked, right? So I don't care what the influence is. But if you take the wickedness out, okay, and you just think about what other cultures of the world have brought to the United States, I think it's beautiful. And I love to uh, try different foods. Praise the Lord for international uh, meals that we're going to have. And I like to see what the uh, other people are are eating and drinking. And some of those cultures have been influenced from other countries and all that kind of stuff. And then the last thing, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about this because it's what I'm going to deal with on Monday, is this. One of the uh, impacts that they've had on the United States is the worship, Christian worship. You know, right? And I'm not going to say a whole lot about that, but largely the, the African influence on American worship and Christianity has led to charismatic movement, basically. That's what it is. And so I'm going to talk more about that on Sunday. But the conclusion is simply this. Look, I don't know what degree, because the, the narrative always is that, you know, these Christians, you know, were so mean and hateful and they, they robbed the Africans from their beliefs and they, they changed them and, and, and they called them savages and they, they wanted to civilize them. And so they took away their cultures and they took away all these things and they tried to make them Christians or whatever. Like, I don't know how much of that narrative is true. I don't know everything that happened. I know there were Muslims and I know there were Christians uh, that were brought over to the United States. And, and, and there's a lot that I'm going to say about the religion on Sunday. But one way or another that culture has been slowly interwoven into the United States. And a lot of it's beautiful, a lot of it's fine. We just want to make sure that anyone who is not a Christian and who has not uh, under, been influenced by the Bible and by, by uh, the gospel has that opportunity to learn that and to believe that. Sometimes we get this idea, and I've talked to missionaries in Africa who have this idea like, oh, it's a super long process and we got to go and teach them our ways and we got to show them how to pray for their meals and we got to show them all these things. And, and maybe a couple years down the road, we can give them the gospel. You're going about it the wrong way, right? The apostle Paul didn't have that. I don't care what they try to say. A lot of those Christians will try to say like, Paul didn't ever just go straight preach. Yes, he did. Every time you see him preaching, he just preaches Christ and he just gives them an opportunity to receive that truth. And then after they receive it, he says, okay, now put away your idols and do all this stuff and change it. And no, don't be so superstitious and all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, we have to just focus on giving them the gospel and let Jesus uh, change them, let the Holy Spirit affect their lives after they receive Christ. Okay. So the, really the need again, same in Africa as it is in the United States, as it is in China, as it is in India, uh, you know, anywhere. They just need Christ. They need to hear the gospel. And the gospel has the power to change lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the influence, uh, influences of cultures everywhere have had on the United States. And, and we have a, a, a great privilege of being here and being a part of that. And as Christians and as evangelistic uh, minded Christians who want to give the gospel. Uh, Lord, help us to just seize on this opportunity to reach other cultures who've come to the United States and to give them the gospel and uh, just freely preach it, freely give it, and then let you do the work in, uh, in uh, growing that seed inside them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.